This is Lori Sonkin with WRFI Radio News. My guest is Karen Cooper. Karen is a research associate at Cornell's Lab of Ornithology. She uses citizen science to study bird life, history, ecology, and conservation. Welcome to WRFI, and thanks for chatting with me, Karen. Thanks, Lori. I'm happy to be here. So we're sitting in sapsucker woods outside the Lab of Ornithology. The birds are singing. The lily ponds are starting to bloom. Karen, if we had a citizen scientist with us, what are some examples of something they might study right here where we are? Well, citizen science really is often about um, people making observations and, and really noticing what's going on in the natural world around them, recording those observations, you know, writing them down, and then sharing them with, into big databases or you're basically sharing them, finding ways to share them with scientists. And so if, if a citizen scientist were here, they would probably be making a checklist of the birds that they see um, they might be noting when flowers are blooming. They could be taking measurements of the weather. There's a whole host of observations that people make every day that a citizen scientist just makes note of and shares. What are some examples of <coughs> citizen science projects around the world? Oh, wow. I mean, there's, there's thousands of projects around the world, and they really cover such a host of topics. Really, almost anything that you can imagine observing I bet you there is a citizen science project about it. So it's not just birds and butterflies and dragonflies, uh, squirrels. <laughs> um, there's a lot of astronomy projects. There's projects related to um, like noise pollution, air pollution, monitoring water quality. There, just everything. There's there's projects where you sample what what lives in your belly button. Wow. <laughs> there's projects with nurdles. <laughs> nurdles are like little microplastics on the beach that you can find, and people can track where those came from. So really, almost any really anything that you might observe, there's a citizen science project about it because there's researchers interested in those observations. So is that what drives someone to become engaged in citizen science? I mean, why would someone want to do it? Why do they want to waste their time? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good question. And really, for a lot of people, it's their hobby. So a lot of times, I mean, people people enjoy observing what's around them, and people love to share what they see. So um, it's it's really, citizen science can be a way of taking a fun hobby and making it more meaningful by using it to contribute to science. And then a lot of times also, there's real environmental problems that people want to learn more about. And so they will take the time to, to measure and quantify and really observe their environment um, so that they can improve their environment. Like at the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, were, were mm -hmm. citizen scientists used there? Oh, very much so, in a lot of different capacities. Um, I mean, well, for one, there were bird watchers there, and uh, the lab's project called eBird. There was a, a lot of people contributing um, bird observations, both of living birds and of birds that had been oiled. And, and then also there were um, sort of uh, bucket brigades, they're called. There were people who, who were monitoring the spill itself. Some of them were using balloons to actually send out cameras to map the spill, because at the time there was a, a media blackout. And there's been people who have been measuring the health consequences. Um, so yeah, there was, there's been a lot of citizen engagement in science um, surrounding the, that oil spill. How do you use citizen scientists in the research that you do? In my research, I rely on bird watchers across the country to, uh, and the observations that they provide to the Lab of Ornithology. Most of my research uses um, observations in a program called Nest Watch, and these are people who monitor nesting birds. Um, and so they'll go out several times a week and um, keep track of, of many aspects of bird reproduction, about when birds lay eggs, how many eggs they lay, how many of those eggs hatch, and when they hatch. And they'll provide that information, um, which I use in my research. And, and that that's goes beyond research that could happen at one single study site. So the patterns that we can see are at a continental scale which is very different than what we can infer from just a lo one local study. Do you, do you offer training sessions? I mean, how do, if people are all over the world, how do you train them? Um, well, there, there's some online training, and there's um, booklets and whatnot. But there's also 
Uh, well, when it comes to bird watchers, there's a lot of local groups, um, like the North American Bluebird Society, and there's a lot of state bluebird societies. There's a lot of Audubon bird watching groups. And really, people will learn from each other. They'll learn from each other the skills that they need to observe birds, to monitor birds, and they'll share that with one another, and, and we'll facilitate that. Um, but really, people learn from each other. How do you make sure that the quality of the data collected is consistent and <clears throat> follows protocols? Yeah, we get that question a lot. <laughs> and there's a whole variety of ways that we um, deal with data quality. And, and it really varies from project to project. You know, we have, um, like, so most of the data come to us via the Internet. And we have what's called smart forms, which means that the forms will sort of uh, be able to flag what might be any data entry errors, like basic errors like that, things that seem out of the ordinary, so that people can double check them. If there's rare sightings, um, it'll immediately, these flags will immediately prompt people to provide, you know, maybe photographs or other ways to, to verify their observations. You know, and then we have a lot of statistical um, methods too for, for spotting outliers or unusual patterns or adjusting for, for example, you know, that a lot of people do these hobbies and they're bird watching on the weekend. And we can make adjustments statistically for, um, for those kinds of things. Have there any, been any studies that looked at, that compared volunteer researchers to paid researchers and the quality of, of the, what they find or what they report? Yeah. Yeah, there's been, I mean, there's been, there's been at least about, I mean, I have seen about 80 or 90 studies that have done that directly in a whole bunch of different fields that have compared the data collected by professionals and the data collected by volunteers. And by and large, for the most part, studies have found that the data are comparable quality. You know, in some cases, there's some data quality issues that need to be addressed, and then usually they can be. Um, and sometimes it's through educating participants and giving designing better protocols. Uh, and sometimes it's through just how you handle the data and address bias. And I will note, too, that, I mean, really any scientific study in data collection has to address issues of bias in data. It's not just something that happens with citizen science data. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, how is citizen science helping to monitor climate change? Oh, well, that's a good question. There's, um, well, <clears throat> really a lot of the information that we have about weather over time has come from citizen scientists. There's the since, oh, let's see... Well, since just after the Civil War, the U.S. started a volunteer um, weather observer program. I believe it's called the Cooperative Weather Observer Network, and it's run through the, the National Weather Service. And, and that consists of people who have weather stations at their homes or are in their property. I mean, actually, I think it's a lot of times um, it's farmers who run these stations. And that forms the basis of a lot of our data that were collected on the ground. And then, of course, there's been a lot of citizen science work with birds and with frogs and all kinds of other animals and plants that have monitored trends over time, particularly in the timing of key life cycle events, like when flowers bloom, when birds begin to nest, and have looked at how um, changing you know, trends in climate have affected these kind of annual events. Are children involved in citizen science projects? Are your children interested in them? <laughs> um, there are a lot of kids who contribute to citizen science. And, well, like, we just recently, I think it was last fall, um, the program eBird had their 100th millionth submission, their 100th millionth ob observation. And they contacted the person and said, congratulations, you submitted our 100th millionth observation. And the person wrote back and said, thank you so much. And by the way, I'm 12 years old. Oh. <laughs> and, and he was this uh, fantastic birder who'd, who'd been interested in birds since he was, you know, like in diapers. Um, but we see that a lot. Um, we are just about out of time, Karen. If someone wants to get in touch with you or if they have a great citizen science idea, um, how can they contact you? Uh, they can contact me either via Twitter, um, Coop Sci Scoop, um, or they can uh, contact me at the Lab of Ornithology. Great. Well, we appreciate you talking with us. Uh, thank you, Karen Cooper. <laughs> Thanks.